In this video I want to continue with the uh, opening out of the quote from Mark Johnson where he talks about meaning and thought emerging from our capacities for perception, object manipulation and bodily movement. And in this one I want to move into that word which I mentioned earlier was a kind of covert metaphor. This word capacity that he uses in that sentence emerge from our capacity for perception. And what I'm just uh, playing with here is this idea that when he's talking about capacity he's talking about space and what I want to argue is that many of the uh, the metaphors the poetics if you like that we use to uh, organize our thinking to organize um, meaning come from metaphors drawn ultimately from uh, from our understandings of space and I'll be reading this from a text I prepared earlier in their book, The View from the Centre of the Universe, Joel Premack and Nancy Abrams say this. In their hearts, most people are still living in an imagined universe where space is simply emptiness, scar stars are scattered randomly, and common sense is a reliable guide. In this imagined universe, we humans have no special place and often feel insignificant. What I want to begin here is a thought that parts company with Premack and Adams and their version of this heartfelt common sense. I want a sense to suggest that common sense tells us that space is anything but simple and that humans do indeed have a special place, indeed as common sense tells us. I want to begin though with the big picture of space before bringing it up close and personal. Thomas Kuhn's notion of the paradigm shift probably an overworked notion actually, but never mind, articulated in the structure of scientific revolutions, postulated that occasionally there are major changes in the way that science understands all or part of the world. Probably the most commonly cited example of such a shift concerns space and how it is conceptualized. This is the Copernican revolution from an Earth-centered universe to one centered on the Sun a revolution in which the old order of theories, models, diagrams and mechanism is dismissed in favour of the new. In Kuhn, it is, it is a necessary consequence of this revolutionary overturning that what went before it becomes wrong and that apostles of the new, after moving through a, br a brief period of being heretics, become keepers of the new flame and upholders of the new truth. Old is wrong, new is right. According to Premack and Adams, a more accurate understanding of what happened during these times is not a replacement of one truth by another, but rather the reinterpretation of the data of the world such that it applies to a wider set of circumstances and covers a larger set of phenomena. They give the example of Newtonian physics giving way to the relativity of Einstein an apparent paradigm shift in which new knowledge describes the universe in ways which are more complete than the old. What they point out, however, is that Newtonian physics is not rendered wrong by the development of this new science. It is simply redefined as a description of parts of the universe only, basically the middle-sized and slow-moving parts, and as long as its methods are applied only to those parts, it is as accurate and more efficient than any other model or method. It was, after all, Newtonian physics that put men on the moon. This understanding of certain descriptions of the world having different applicability than others also applies to our understandings of space. The Ptolemaic picture of the Earth-centered universe is not wrong in any transcendental sense. It is instead a local interpretation of the data concerning planetary movement. In many cases, it is preferable to work with the assumption that the Earth is indeed stationary and central, rather than orbital and peripheral. When we make appointments, or set our watches, or book our holidays, we do not consider this as stating the location of the Earth as in its orbit around the Sun, or the number of degrees through which it has rotated. We refer to sunrise, not earthfall, and we watch the sun go down over the ocean, not the earth turning its face away into the darkening night. For most purposes, the Ptolemaic model of the universe in which earth is the centre of attention 
is sufficient. This is not to say that when we use such earth-centered concepts we are using a kind of lazy shorthand or are being inaccurate. When the application of the Ptolemaic paradigm is limited to specific uses such as these it is as accurate and in many, many cases more efficient than the Copernican. On an even more local scale of embodied experience we can extend this notion of overlapping or simultaneous paradigms to include the apparently self-evident wrong-headedness of flat earth theory. The earth when seen from space is obviously a ball and any depiction of the earth as a two-dimensional surface is demonstrably inaccurate. However in day-to-day -day life we routinely work with the assumption that it is indeed a flat plane and a rarely proved wrong. When we measure a room prior to fitting a carpet or stake out the foundations of a building we do not take the spherical nature of the earth into account. It would be perfectly possible to include this curvature in our calculations but since this difference would be insignificant smaller by far than the variations in the landscape itself it would be foolish to do so. It is at this level that embodied experience and the paradigms which make up that experience become available as accurate relevant theory. There are therefore good pragmatic reasons why we might assume that the earth is flat and why we might live large parts of our lives in the shadow of that assumption. Furthermore there would be very little reason at all why we should develop an intuition which suggests otherwise. From the perspective of our evolutionary history there would be no benefit to be gained from this kind of abstract spherical knowing in stark contrast with the distinct advantages claimed by those of our ancestors who cared less about such abstractions and more about the tiger hiding in the bushes at the other side of the apparently flat clearing in this forest. Given the tiny slice of human history during which knowledge of the curvature of the earth would be advantageous, basically since the advent of extended seafaring, it is wildly unlikely that we would have a naturally intuitive grasp of this reality. Our phylogeny as well as our phenomenology constantly proposes and confirms our positions as flat earthers. What I want to suggest here is that while we are able to fully grasp the idea of the earth as a ball spinning in the empty space that Premack and Abrams attributed to common sense, in fact this sense is anything but common. In point of phenomenal fact, our senses tell us and told thousands of generations of our ancestors that we are standing on a plane beneath a dome of sky looking out to a horizon that encircles us. This is one of the experiential logics of embodied space that I believe structure our cognition and that I want to explore. This organized perception of space in which the organizing principle is the human sensory motor system contributes to the repertoire of structures which allow meaning and thought to emerge. All space, from the most counterintuitive of Einstein and Hilbert to the most transparently familiar of Newton and Descartes, is rendered sensible through the confabulatory cognitive operations I talked about earlier. Yet it is this embodied phenomenal space which we are perhaps most comfortable describing in terms of poetics, as indeed Gaston Bachelard did in his most famous book, The Poetics of Space. The philosopher Michel Foucault had this to say about Bachelard's work, which resonates strongly with the sense that I am groping for here. He says, Bachelard's monumental work and the descriptions of phenomenologists have taught us that we do not live in a homogeneous and empty space, but on the contrary, in a space thoroughly imbued with quantities and perhaps thoroughly phantasmatic as well. The space of our primary perception, the space of our dreams and that of our passions, hold within themselves qualities that seem intrinsic. There is a light ethereal transparent space, or again a dark rough encumbered space, a space from above of summits, or on the contrary a space from below of mud 
or again a space that can be flowing like sparkling water or a space that is fixed congealed like stone or crystal embodied phenomenal space has a poetic logic of its own the logic the local interpretation of universal laws that our bodies obey and perform this space I would argue is the one which most readily provides the capacity in which meaning and thought might emerge okay that's when I leave it for today thanks very much for watching